I'm John Korstein, Director Emeritus of the USS Monitor Center here at the Mariner's Museum Park. Nor shall your glory be forgot by fame her record keeps, while honor points to the hallowed ground where valor proudly sleeps. That's a nice little poem, or part of a poem by Henry Timrod, who actually was at one of the first uh, Memorial Day celebrations. And you know, when the War of the Rebellion ended, veterans and citizens both North and South recognized the need to honor those who perished during such a bloody conflict. Memorial Day appears to have been uh, actually practice during the war itself. Um, this scene, as you see, is the burial of Latine. Um, and of course, you can see the flowers, flowers already on the, the casket about to be buried. This is one of the real first views of how we evolved from Memorial Day and Decoration Day into the current holiday that we enjoy. And so some people uh, have different views about when it really began, but I have to tell you, in my opinion, the first uh, one was this one. And this is the grave of Captain John Quincy Marr. And he is the first officer killed during uh, the war. And he is uh, randomly shot. He's out in the um, a clover field away from where his men are. And he had a shot that went all the way through his overcoat, his regular coat, and actually barely pierced the skin. Some people think he died from a heart attack. Anyway, he was a noted lawyer from Warrington. And so when they brought his body uh, back into um a Warrington for the grave. They, of course, erected this monument and then they strewn the grave as with flowers. And that started to be uh, the beginning of kind of like de Decoration Day, but in the South, we called it Memorial Day. Um, you know, and when we think of the military, there are several days that we honor the military Armed Forces Day. Um, Memorial Day, Veterans Day, and these are all very important dates for us, but Memorial Day sets itself apart in many, many ways. Now, I have to tell you, who claims where it began? And believe it or not, this is a big argument. And so the Department of Veterans Affairs says there are approximately 25 places claimed to have originated the holiday, believe it or not. Um, actually, there is a center uh, for uh, Memorial Day research at the University of Georgia, and they tried to break down um, this idea. Now, the idea or the um, habit or yeah, the habit of decorating the graves of the fallen dates back hundreds of years, but no one expresses it formally as a holiday. And so um, and many of the claims people have are going to be filled with myths. However, it believed that in 1862, actually, um, they will uh, bury uh, some soldiers killed at, in 61. They bury some soldiers killed at uh, First Manassas, and they will actually have a ceremony burying them all. And as a result of that, uh, they have, uh, you know, that's kind of the beginning of this Memorial Day. Um, we know, I already talked about Warrington. Um, in Savannah, they actually had a very formal ceremony in July of 1862 uh, for the grave of Colonel Francis S. Bartow and his comrades who died during the first battle of Manassas Bull Run, call it what you will. Then, as soon as the war is over, they have one on April 26, 1865, in Jackson, Mississippi, 
where a woman named Sue Langdon Vaughn decorated the graves of Confederate and Union so and Union soldiers. I think that's a very big point. Um, and so this story doesn't really appear until 1891. So, you know, you kind of wonder, is that true? Uh, also, one of the most unusual Memorial Day ceremonies in the South occurred on May 1st, 1865 in Charleston, South Carolina, where the newly freed African Americans held a parade of over 10,000 people. Um, and the there's all these reports and newspapers about this event. It's once again, May 1st. And um, that this was a um, mostly overlooked event, but uh, they were honoring not so much the fallen, but they were honoring that the fallen gave them freedom. And that's a slight difference. Um, so Columbus, Georgia, oh my gosh, um, has another claim to being the first Memorial Day. And Mary Ann Williams um, was a secretary of the ladies Memorial Association of Columbus. Now, the Ladies Memorial Association is eventually going to evolve into what's called the United Daughters of the Confederacy. But then they actually choose a date, April 26, where that everyone needed to honor the graves of the fallen by placing flowers or strew strewn flowers upon the graves. And on the 26th, we know in 1866 that uh, there are several events that are held in Louisville, uh, Kentucky, New Orleans, LA, Jackson, Mississippi, Montgomery, Alabama, uh, in Georgia, Atlanta, Macon, Columbus. Uh, so it's becoming a, a regular type of holiday. Um, and April 66, four women of Columbus gathered together to decorate the graves of Confederate soldiers. They also felt moved to honor the Union soldiers buried there and to note the grief of their families by decorating their graves as well. This, this is a real great story, humanity. However, I have to say, um, really the... Um, first really recorded one is going to be in Charleston. And actually there's a poem written about it uh, and by Henry Timrod once again. Um, now it, the, he turned it into a song, but it is published as a poem in his book of poetry. Uh, I guess you can see Henry Timrod, uh, who was called the poet laureate of the South. And this was sung on the occasion of decorating the graves of the Confederate dead at Magnolia Cemetery, Charleston, South Carolina, April 26, 1867. Sleep sweetly in your humble graves, sleep martyrs of a fallen cause, though yet no marble column craves the pilgrim here to pause. In seeds of laurel in the earth, the blossom of your fame is blown, and somewhere waiting for its birth is the shaft is in the stone. Meanwhile, behalf the tardy years which keep your trust in story tombs, behold your sisters, bring their tears, and the memorial blooms. Stoop angels hither from the sky, there is no holier spot of ground than where defeated valor lies by morning beauty crowns. You're starting to see with that poem that, okay, we're going to we're going to commemorate the folks in the South. Um, and by 67, actually, as we'll learn a little farther in this program, that the U.S. Graves Commission will actually be going through the South and setting up individual Southern or Union uh, burial grounds. And we'll see pictures of all that. We had some. Now, in the North, when do we start really trying to memorialize? Um, and that's going to actually be, um, you can see the Southern ladies here decorating the graves. 
Um, and uh, that's a related to the poem I just read. This is really, uh, actually there's some states that celebrated mem Memorial Day or Confederate Memorial Day um, here at the unveiling of the Jefferson Davis statue in Richmond in 1907. And you can see the crowd. Uh, it is pretty uh, amazing uh, how they uh, viewed this. So we'll go back to this topic a little later. However, this is in the South or in the North, really where you can see everything. And um, Abraham Lincoln is the guy with a sparse head of hair without a hat on. And you can see the larger man next to him. And so that is Abraham Lincoln giving his Gettysburg Address. And so many claim that it is Abraham Lincoln that really is the man that was the founder of Memorial Day. Now, I have to tell you, even before the next year, the ladies of Bowlesville, Pennsylvania, uh, will on July 4th, 1864, decorate the graves. And so they claim that they are the originator in the north of what eventually will be called Decoration Day. Now, so they're decorating the, the, the graves of their fathers and brothers and cousins. It's a very som somber ceremony. Um, so it just so happens that July 4th was also a Monday. So let's keep that in mind. However, nowhere, there was no constant ceremony in the North. And so it just so happens that... Uh, um, uh, well, see, this is also Memorial Day as the nation mourns. We're sitting here looking at uh, this is a form of Memorial Day that really shocked the North because everywhere Lincoln's body went, they had a huge parade. They had these uh, commemorations in honor of not just Lincoln, but what Lincoln stood for. Lincoln stood for preservation of the Union. Lincoln stood for this terrible struggle that tried to qualify and define the meaning of freedom to all Americans. So that's, you know, really, but it's on a wrong date and only it's a one time thing. Here you go. This is the real dude who started Memorial Day. And this is Major General John Alexander Logan. And I have to tell you, Logan was a dynamic figure during the war, prior to the war. He was a member of Congress. He was an eloquent speaker. And so he went out without resigning from uh, Congress and without a commission. He goes out and participates in the Battle of Fort Donelson and says, I got to be part of this. So he's a politician. So he gets to be a brigadier general. However, he's excellent. Uh, he will be a leading uh, commander at the um, conquest of Vicksburg. He will serve in the Army of the West um, and actually in Sherman's march to uh, capture Atlanta. He is there in a leadership role. Uh, Logan, of course, um, at the end of the war, he is one of the organizers of this uh, grand parade that they'll have. Um, but Logan issues, now there's a group that's called the Grand Army of the, of the Republic. And that Grand Army of the Republic is something that was created by the veterans as soon as this war is over. And they do so to make sure that everyone remembers the tremendous sacrifice that was given. That's why Logan will actually um, give a, um, actually a directive on May 5th, 1868, that on May 30th is an official day that we will place flowers upon the graves of our comrades and the fallen. So this is actually the first official Decoration Day ceremony uh, that's featuring Ulysses S. Grant and also John Logan. Uh, Logan, by this time, is a senator. Uh, he's actually um, 
going to be the impeachment manager uh, for the impeachment of Andrew Johnson. So this guy is a powerful politician. Um, and this is, uh, of course, at Arlington Cemetery. And so uh, we can see that it is uh, very, very important to everyone. Now, in the South, we have the graves of thousands upon thousands of Union soldiers. And as soon as the war was over, many, remember this is reconstruction, many uh, Northern leaders, ex-commanders, enlisted men, feared that the Union graves that were all over the battlefield. I mean, you could have gone to the battlefield of Gaines Mill, Cold Harbor, and see shallow graves with their, bon I won't go too far, it's lunchtime, but uh, all out. And so they set up a U.S. Graves Commission uh, because they want to honor people like this man. This is William Scott. And William Scott was a member of the 3rd Vermont Regiment. He actually was on guard duty. Now, what he did, uh, he had his own guard duty, but his friends said, you know, I don't feel well. Will you take my next guard duty? And, which was, so simultaneously, he's at guard for almost, well, eight hours and then another eight hours. But he doesn't make it through the whole eight hours. What happens? He falls asleep. Right. And uh, they catch him. And a lot of people have been doing this. It was lax. And so the U.S. Army wanted to make an example to all their soldiers. So they through a court martial. They said William Scott was going to be hanged for dereliction of duty. Well, when Abraham Lincoln hears about this on the very day of the execution, he'll hop on his horse, he'll ride out to the place of execution and says, stop, and this man has been pardoned. And the president can show up and do that. And so William Scott says, you know, thank you so much, uh, but I promise you, that I'm willing to lay down my life at any time and anywhere in the quest of the union and the quest of freedom. Wow. Now look at this guy. He is, um, you know, a dyna, he's six foot two. So he's a big man. And so at the battle of dam number one on April 16, 1862, w William Scott, will be mortally wounded in the attack against the Confederate uh, defenses. This is during the um, siege of Yorktown in uh, April to early May, 1862, a very, very major event. Now, Julian Scott, who's a musician, will cross that river that's boiling like with bullets like sap. And he'll bring William Scott and others back to the uh, other side of the river. And so William Scott is one of these little posts. So after the war, this U.S. Graves Commission is going to do what? They go and get these bodies. By the way, Julian Scott becomes a very famous painter, and he actually received the Medal of honor in 1864 for his heroism at the Battle of Dam Number 1, which is all part of the Peninsula Campaign. So what they did is they created a national cemetery. You can see the gravekeeper's house, and you can see the stones, which if you go to um, actually uh, various cemeteries like this, um, you can actually see those very stones. Uh, this is the classic um, uh, gravekeeper's house, um, and uh, it was called Lodge, by the way, and this one was in Hampton, Virginia, and of course, you can go to the Hampton Cemetery, and you can see where all these um, soldiers had been buried. In fact, they're two African-American Medal of Honor winners, 
recipients, they're not winners, they're recipients, uh, buried in Hampton. Uh, and so uh, it is, uh, in fact, the first Union soldier to die in um, the Civil War in Virginia is going to be buried there uh, because this is right next to the now the Veterans Administration, then the Hampton Hospital, which was said, if you got there, you had a 90% chance of survival. The big term is if you got there. Okay, so anyway, this was raised, unfortunately, but you can go to battlefields throughout the South, and you can actually see these um, keepers' homes or lodges, and you can realize that this is all happening right after the end of the War of the Rebellion, especially this mansard roof. Man, that was popular right after the war. So um, we can get a great idea of what is uh, happening in the North. This is one of the most powerful organizations of veterans in the North and perhaps throughout the United States. This is the Grand Army of the Republic marching. And that guy in the front rank there, that is William Tecumseh Sherman, right? So every year they would have an event. And so that, and this event is happening on May 30th. Doesn't matter if May 30th is a Wednesday or a Thursday or what, if they had the event. Um, and uh, so you can see this one uh, that happens in 1915, see the GAR, uh, that Grand Army of Republic. And so you can see all these are veterans that uh, survived the war. And you know the tradition of Memorial Day is going to continue now. The term Decoration Day starts to get more merged with the idea of Memorial Day. However, in North and South, they celebrate them on different days. So I have to tell you that um, uh, there is a similarity, but what the Southerners do is they add Confederate Memorial Day. And they're going to celebrate it on various days. And this was all part of the Ladies Memorial Association. And they're the ones that really helped to make this day in the South anyway, become extremely important. By eight, 1916, 10 Southern states celebrated it on June 3rd, the birth date of Jefferson Davis. Other states used 26th of April uh, or May 10. Um, and so it is going to be held in states. It becomes a state holiday, but there's no federal recognition other than federal military units and so forth where appropriate became part of it. Now, um, I have to say they had this, uh, um, and you can see here, and actually, that looks like a big gun, and I, 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 I don't think it's a Springfield. I think it's uh, a different type of gun, uh, although it looks like it, but it's so huge in perspective. It could be a, uh, uh, well, I won't comment on that. Oh, so, so you see, uh, even during World War II, the Memorial Day celebration, all these kids uh, celebrating. This is 30 May. Why are they wearing coats? because this is in Maine, okay? And so it's still cold up there at this time. And so um, this is what um, the holiday formally evolved into, the cleaning and decoration of the graves of those who have fallen. By 1915, um, um, or by 1919 19, actually, we began to say, well, it's not just Confederate veterans that we should honor. We have to, or Union veterans that we have to honor from the Civil War. What we have to do is honor those people who served during the Spanish-American War, as well as World War I. Just think of what Lieutenant Colonel John McRae wrote. 
We cherish too the poppy red that grows in the fields where valor led. It seems to signal to the skies that blood of heroes never die. Oh my gosh. Um, and so that's when we started to wear the red poppies in our coats um, or anywhere in honor of this, this day. Now in Europe, they actually started to bring out the red poppies um, out after the, when the first Armistice Day is celebrated on November 11th. So we actually have two different holidays that are utilizing the um, uh, utilizing the poppy as a symbol of remembrance of those who are fallen. Swear down by the graves of the fallen that you will never forget, wrote Robert Graves, the great uh, English poet. So, wow, you know, we're now getting to a lot of fun. Uh, well, I won't say fun, but the holiday is going to start to have different aspects to it. Notice the Indianapolis race, now known as Indianapolis 500, this is a view of it in 1912. Well, I'm going to tell you all right now that when they started this, oh my gosh, the Grand Army of the Republic said, how dare you taint this holiday with a car race? It is denigrating everything it stands for. Well, it just so happens that the mayor of Indianapolis and groups, other groups, right, that have been formed on Spanish American veterans and so forth, guess what they'll do? They'll say, even though the General Assembly of Indianapolis says, we're going to stop that race, the mayor of Indianapolis, the Chamber of Congress of Indianapolis all said, no, we're not, because this is another way to get the public involved and to memorize the event with greater joy, joy based on the uh, fallen, the fallen we celebrate. Uh, so it becomes, uh, this is a very famous event. And really the first time we start to see a commercial aspect added to Memorial Day. And because of this, we know that um, um, we have uh, uh, other ways we start to support it. Now I gotta tell you, you know, I was a lifeguard on Fort Monroe in, uh, you know, 1970 through 77. Oh my gosh, surfs up. But Memorial Day was the greatest day. Uh, and of course, you know, my father was an officer in the army, so I appreciated Memorial Day what it was, but actually it was beginning of my summer job and being on the beach. So basically, you know, all of a sudden, um, we have this holiday that is is actually becomes the beginning of the holiday or summer season. Now, actually, in 1971, LBJ um, Lyndon Baines Johnson will pass an act that moves the date of Memorial Day to not from May 30th but actually to the last Monday in May, and which Johnson said, this will enable families who live some distance apart to spend more time together. It is called the Uniform um, Monday Holiday Act, and soon it's gonna be added to several other holidays like President's Day, Labor Day. Um, now, once again, uh, the Southerners, join in with this because it becomes a national holiday. Although some states like Texas still will celebrate their, their Memorial Day on 19 January, it stays a state holiday. Um, and actually there are other states that use other dates, but solely but surely those dates are all added to Memorial Day. Now, if the GAR was around a day, they would be aghast, right, at this. Look at cemetery planters is misspelled. Oh my gosh. So, you know, but anyway, it all becomes 
you know, a day of sales. You all know about the Memorial Day sales. They are everywhere. And so um, I have to say I ignored them, but it is. So Memorial Day has merged into being, number one, a uh, day of remembrance, a day to go at three o'clock. Now, I got to tell you what um, Clinton did in 2000 created the national moment of remembrance and the national moment of remembrance was to be held at three o'clock on the afternoon of monday that is memorial day the last monday in the month and at 3 p.m the flags are supposed to be dropped to half mast and you're supposed to have a minute of silence and then if you're in a cemetery where fallen valor lays you would indeed hear the bugle call known as TAPS. And I have to tell you, TAPS uh, was actually created during the Peninsula Campaign. Some claim on Fort Monroe, uh, but really it's at Harrison's Lanyon Landing, Daniel Butterfield mixed a bunch of different tunes, and you had TAPS, which is extremely solemn. And so at these national cemeteries and other places, TAPS is always sung. And as Henry Timrod wrote in uh, 1868, hold up the glories of thy dead to thine own self be true. Land that he loved, come honor now this grave that honors you. So that's my little take on Memorial Day. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm quite very happy to try and answer them. Uh, it's, it's a a fabulous story, but most people just don't remember the emotion that came right at the end of the war. And so we got two emotions. The you know, Memorial Day in the South uh, becomes really a celebration over the lost cause because the Ladies Memorial becomes the United Daughters of Confederacy. So they're trying to reinforce the lost cause and Confederate, um, as they would say, society. Um, that, of course, somewhat inappropriate. That's why we merge everything together, uh, because now it's not about Confederates. It's about every veteran from the French and Indian War all the way up to um, actually the war in Afghanistan and the war in Iraq. So we're celebrating all those who try to protect our nation's freedom. And that is why that grave commission set up these beautiful graveyards. Uh, if you live in the Hampton Roads region, I urge you to go to Yorktown. I urge you to go there because, you know, uh, you actually, I can go and there are these men that we can all record who they are. That is where valor kindly sleeps. Okay. John, show, show us um, Tim Rod. I don't think you got to him. Oh, sorry. There he is. Oh. Um, I never, I never get to all of them. Um, and this is Tim Rod. And of course he was a prolific poet. Um, and, um, so, and, and he becomes a symbol of the Southern Memorial Day. Cause I'll tell you, I got a whole book of his poetry and half of these poems, right? Am I showing it right? Uh, anyway, half of these poems are all about valor. You know, as Robert Graves says, look down by the uh, graves of the war and promise never, never to forget. And that's what all these people are trying to do. The sacrifices that brought us freedom. We do have some questions, John. Um, before I get to those, I want to ask before I forget it, the lodge keepers in the national cemeteries that lived in those mansard roofed homes, was that a military or civilian job? It's a civilian job, the U.S. Grave Commission. Okay. And it's a kind of separate. They manage the graves in Normandy, uh, they at the, you know, all over Europe. Uh -huh. um, where we have American graves. So they are not a military 
necessary. They're organized by act of Congress mm -hmm. in 1866 to protect, preserve, and commemorate the fallen, the union fallen is very particular, union fallen from the war of the rebellion. Mm -hmm. Notice, you know, one thing that's really taken me is that uh, there's an official name for the Civil War, and we call it all sorts of things. Uh, I know I have, but it's actually by Congress, the War of the Rebellion. Right. Uh, Carolyn asked, the national cemeteries, except for a small portion of Arlington, do not include Confederate graves. Is that correct? That is correct. And the reason being is because um, most of the Confederates... Um, were either moved to certain churchyards or had mass burials near the battlefield. And okay. they were already taken care of by the Ladies Memorial Association. So they didn't, and, and that Ladies Memorial Association, even though in their first celebrations in 66 and 67, they honored the Union fallen, but they did not. Uh, continue doing that. And they did not take the effort to go out there and have proper burials for all these people who had died, uh, Union soldiers who had died. So that's why <clears throat> you very rarely see a uh, Confederate soldier in one of those. There are some, I have to say, but generally speaking, it's all Union. Interesting. Yes. William ask, was there any organized memorial or decoration of the deceased soldiers of the Mexican War, or did this practice begin with the Civil War? It began with the, uh, the, the Civil War, but I got to tell you, actually, West Point builds the first memorial to um, uh, fallen from the Mexican War is this beautiful Greek Revival Chapel. It's called the Old Chapel on West Point. And that's where the first West Point graduates are going to die in war. And so this thing is Gothic and high Gothic. Uh, and uh, so it's a you know, pretty fabulous. They don't bury anyone there anymore, I don't think. I know my father was buried there what, five years ago, but I don't think they have any room anymore. And so I guess you had to be a big cheese to get in there. I don't know. <laughs> so uh, uh, it's, it's a solemn place. And, and then you look at the stained glass windows there, you're really amazed. You know, likewise in the South, the first real monument is going to be Blandford Church because Blandford Cemetery has a mass grave of over yeah. 15,000 Confederates, I think the number is. And that's also where William Mahone is buried. And so the Ladies Memorial Association, yay team, and the United Daughters of the Confederacy all restored this abandoned Anglican church, which is beautiful. I mean, the, the um, uh, I mean, it's Flemish bond with glazed headers. You know, the I'm into that. A pardon? The stained glass. And the windows window. were all made by Tiffany's at cost, and they all represent every state mm -hmm. that served in the Confederacy, as well as those states like Kentucky and Maryland and Missouri, mm -hmm. that had actually mustered units to serve uh, in the, um, uh, the, the War of the Rebellion. And, and so, um, and, and some states, they all raised their own money and they approached Lewis Comfort Tiffany. He actually gave money to restore the church. And those windows are just fabulous to go see. So if you have not been to the Battle of um, Petersburg, because yes. uh, you, know, you know where the crater is, but when you get off the battlefield, just take a right on Crater Road and poof, maybe 500 yards, if that much, is Blandford Church. And that's where all these people who died uh, during the sea are, are all Confederates who died. See, the Confederates burying their folks, they're not burying the 
union folks. And so that's why um, uh, we have this grave commission. Well, okay, what else? Want, you want to make sure you are at Blanford at the right light, the time of day, because it it's a huge difference to get to see those windows when they've got the natural light coming. Through. Yes. But highly recommend that as as John did for a, a day trip for those of us around here. Um, yeah. William is sharing that Private William Scott's body was moved to the National Cemetery at Yorktown. Yes. And his remains are located beneath grave marker 351. Right. And, so, and that's why I made that um, illusion uh, in the program. I, you saw where the stakes were used to say where he was. Right. The big thing is after the war, those sticks are moved and so forth. So some of the veterans go back to these various eras and say, yeah, this is where these guys are buried. And so they can identify the uh, remains and they're put into this national cemetery. Why? Because if you're at dam number one, you're out in the piney woods of War County and the com local Confederates did, sadly to say, did not care to care for those bodies. Um, and that was why, you know, that National Cemetery is set up. So it's right behind the French um, battery, uh, main battery. And uh, uh, so if you park in to see the French main battery, then you can actually, woo, go right next door to see the, um, the graves. Uh, it, it, including William Scott. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. I thought I explained it, but not well enough. And I apologize. Well, no, he's just clarifying his grave marker. I'll go look for him now. Um, was it Richard Nixon in 1971 president? Yes, he was, but, okay. but Lyndon but Baines, did it? Uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson started it all in 68. Um, and I, okay. I forgot to add that, so I apologize. Okay. So which one do we have to thank for getting a paid day off on Monday? Um, basically, it would be, um, I think, the Uniform Monday Holiday Act is passed under um, Nixon. Johnson says it's going to be... Um, on the last Monday, and that is gonna be a national holiday. But Nixon makes it happen, you know, uh, um, as a uh, national holiday and um, that, uh, you know, you have to celebrate and, uh, you know, he, codif he codifies with uh, Johnson. Johnson actually said he picked this uh, town in New York and said they had the first one. And everyone goes, no, they didn't. But every little town, uh, like to claim we had the first celebration of uh, Memorial Day, uh, but I don't. Uh, I don't care uh, who had the first. I think it is amazing how quickly we began to decorate the graves of the fallen, mm -hmm. and, and that actually happens during the war. That picture of uh, Latine's burial. It's fancified because, you know, you can see the flowers, you can see the mourning women. Uh, and this lady was supposed to be actually doing the service. However, a Methodist minister showed up at the very last moment and did the burial ceremony. So this is fictitious and yet it's got great symbolism involved in it. How the ladies mourn. Um, and actually it has some Confederate symbol, symbolism uh, because you can see the enslaved there helping bury um, one of their enslavers. And so that is, you know, a, uh, a message that we don't always see or don't want to see um, because, uh, uh, it, 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 it's reinforcing enslavement, which is bad. And the painter was a descendant of George Washington. Yes, uh, like a uh, third cousin. Mm -hmm. um, oh, wow. So, you know, I had my uh, 
email address up if you have some more questions you can wait, always wait, wait. we got a oh. couple more oh whoa 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 a couple whoa. more um a viewer says they're fairly confident that there are confederate graves maybe of unknown soldiers at the appomattox national cemetery in hopewell virginia can you comment on that um that would have happened yes um and there's some in yorktown Okay. And so very rarely are they mingled in because the South had created, you know, the, the, like the after the battle, um, let's say the Union win, you got to get rid of all those bodies um, because of health issues. And so they throw them into mass graves. And so with limited identification, we didn't have... Uh, dog tags back then you know mm -hmm. one reason why we had a dog tag that could break is to put or they had two of them one in your mouth and one they send to the graves commission mm -hmm. so yes and occasionally you will see confederate soldiers um, in these uh, national cemeteries but it is a rarity as opposed to what the confederates do with their own i mean there's a mass uh, confederate grave at um Hollywood Cemetery in Richmond. Uh, there are all sorts of Confederates buried uh, at St. Luke's Church in what was once called Jerusalem, but then became Cortland, Virginia, uh, because that was part of Longstreet Suffolk campaign. And these people are dying of disease. And so they get buried at what became the community um, uh the community graveyard mm -hmm. fernando our good friend from venezuela has a, <laughs> a nice question and comment to close out the questions fernando says i've noticed in several civil wars the wounds of those wars are very difficult to heal anniversaries in the battlefields were almost unthinkable do you think decoration day helped the nation to heal its wounds well, I, I have about four answers to that. Um, I think uh, at first with a separate Memorial Day in the South and a separate Decoration Day in the North, um, they are celebrating their soldiers. It's not all American soldiers. It is, you know, Confederate soldiers. And they, they really make that a difference because they call it Confederate Memorial Day. Mm -hmm. And in the North, it's called Decoration Day. Uh, so the animosity between the regions continues. In fact, um, during the Spanish-American War, they actually bring out of retirement several Confederate generals to lead the troops in uh, Cuba. Uh, in fact, my favorite story is Joe Wheeler, Confederate general, West Pointer, and he's taking a nap under a tree and a bunch of a Mauser, you know, bullets go over his head and he stands up claps his hands let's go kill those damn yankees and so you know uh but yes eventually i believe that as more wars come and we recognize that no matter whether you were born in the south or the north um that if you perished as part of the war that you uh, deserved great you know nor shall your glory be forgot while fame her record keeps, while valor points proudly to where valor sleeps. And that is like, that's a Henry Tinrod mm -hmm. that's actually at the Battle of um, Bentonville in North Carolina. Um, so uh, it's part of a big longer poem he did, but uh, yeah, I, I think um, at first, um, it's to honor all soldiers. It quickly changes, you know, because of reconstruction, et cetera. Um, during World War I, um, we still have some of this animosity, believe it or not. And that is why um, we see uh, these forts in the South be named in honor of them. Confederate generals. It's all because we're trying to bring ourselves together in unity. And so I, I think that after World War I, we start to recognize uh, a little more that um, we're honoring everybody because we had so many graves of the fallen from uh, World War I 
Some were buried in Europe, some were shipped back, but primarily those graveyards, um, like at uh, Chateau Thierry, uh, that, that, that's where they fell. Mm -hmm. And uh, a very tremendous um, uh, feeling when you go to some of those cemeteries. Advance to the last slide, please, John. Oh my God. And so we can just let people know, um, we do have blogs. There's a really great blog posted today by John about the contraband of war decision. If you were with us last Friday for the Zoom program, that blog is now up. And one of our colleagues, Jane Jones, has posted one about TAPS, which is really wonderful as well. So uh, in keeping with, with this weekend's commemoration. Um, we will post this program on YouTube next Saturday. So please tell your friends and family if they didn't see it today or if you'd like to watch it again. And although we opened our galleries today, we will continue through this year for, for sure with the virtual programming because we have to have Fernando um, with us. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're going to continue these yes. for long into the future because yes. it's really great for the Mariners Museum to be able to share all the knowledge we have here mm -hmm. with people so many thousands of miles away. Exactly. And so I, I'm, I'm very appreciative of it. This was our response that we did 13 months ago to COVID. You know, we it's had our Lex. My la last public lecture was in March and in, in the museum. Yep. And so we just hit the ground running in April and really kind of uh, evolved into the type of program we're doing mm -hmm. now, which we were very pleased that we have so many people participate. Absolutely. And I will um, give a shout out for next Friday, we will have a Hampton Roads lecture from a colleague of mine that is the archivist and historian at Norfolk Naval Shipyard about the 30 plus ships that were either built or repaired at the Portsmouth, Virginia, Norfolk Naval Shipyard that went overseas to D-Day, which is 77 years ago tomorrow. And so Mark Robbins will be sharing that program with us. Um, John gets a day off and he'll be back the next Friday with a Civil War lecture about the CSS Stonewall. So with that, we will sign off. Thank you all for joining us and have a safe Memorial Day weekend and we will see you next time. Thank you all.